Everybody on the line, I'd like to welcome you and say thank you for joining us today. I am Trish Hutcherson, Orion Health Corps Marketing Director, and I will be with you throughout today's <coughs> session as your moderator. On behalf of everybody here at Orion, we hope you enjoy today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping items. Today's phone lines will be muted for the duration of the session. And if at any time you do have a question, please feel free to enter them into the GoToMeeting dashboard on your screen. Technical and or logistical questions will be answered in real time. However, questions related to the content will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation. After today's session is over, you will be receiving a short survey, and we'd ask that you complete it to let us know how we did. In addition, you will be receiving an audio playback option as well as the slides from today's presentation. And with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Marty Martin. Dr. Martin is a licensed clinical health psychologist and former HR executive at organizations like the John Hopkins Health System and Tulane Hospital and Clinics. He has nearly 20 years of frontline experience working with executives, managers, clinicians, and entrepreneurs to leverage the talent of organizations in order to deliver high quality, safe, and profitable health care. In his current role as director and associate professor, at DePaul University, Marty designs and delivers high-impact, engaging courses and seminars for healthcare leaders and clinicians seeking to create and sustain a competitive <coughs> advantage by leveraging the talent of their organizations. Dr. Martin earned his Psych D and MPH degrees from Rutgers and his MA from Catholic University and BS from Xavier University of Louisiana. We, Orion would like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Martin as well as the Urgent Care Association of America for their partnership in presenting this webinar. So Dr. Martin, whenever you're ready, please feel free to go ahead and get started. All right, thank you so much, Trish, and uh, thank you for everybody that's attending and participating, um, whether you're with a group of individuals or just by yourself. My, my goal for today is to really address a topic that most of you are familiar with, which is what I might call taming disruptive behavior. And my real hope is at the end of the hour, is that you think about what's happening in your workplace, and if you're in a position where you can make a change, where you can decrease the prevalence of this or make sure it doesn't happen again, then I would strongly encourage you to do so. And you'll find out a little bit more later in the presentation why I'm emphasizing this point. So this is really not the type of kickback and relax presentation, although I'm going to try to make it enjoyable, but I really want it to be a call to action. And I'll talk about why that's so important in a little bit later. But let's dive in and let's look at some of the learning goals that we have for this particular course. So if you think, so if you think about the learning goals, the first is to define disruptive behavior, but define it with regard to your organization and maybe even your department. So we're not going to focus on theoretical and abstract notions, but defining it in your organization. Because different organizations have different cultures. Quite frankly, in you know, the northeast part of the country, people are a bit more abrasive, a bit more direct, which could be construed as rude somewhere else. So you have to think about regional differences, um, inpatient differences, outpatient differences. All those things come into play in terms of defining disruptive behavior in your organization. The other learning goal, which is really highlighted here, is to make the connection between handling disruptive behavior and promoting a culture of safety. Safety for patients as well as safety for staff. And also making sure that you see the linkages that when disruptive behavior occurs within healthcare organizations, that does not bode well for quality. It does not bode well for patient engagement or employee engagement. So really, a notion that I want to strike out there is having a zero tolerance climate. And in fact, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, AACN, came out with a whole promulgation and policy around zero tolerance for disruptive behavior. Now some of you might be saying, wait a minute, that's just going too far. There's no way in the world that we can have no incidents whatsoever. So I've asked you the question, so what's the favorable percentage? 10%, 5%, 20%? And what are you going to tell the individual who's a victim of this? What are you going to tell their family members? What are you going to tell a patient that also happens to be a victim of this behavior, that this fits within our zone of tolerance? So think about zero tolerance. 
And the next learning goal is to address disruptive behavior when it first appears. And I'll give you a five-step process to do this. It's going to be a little bit confrontational, but you can think about who benefits when you intervene. The last one is stop making excuses for high performers or what I would call politically protected employees. Not politically correct, but politically protected employees. And you know who those folks are. In most organizations, some people can get away with a whole lot of nonsense and others cannot. So those are our goals. To sum it up, focus on safety, quality, performance, and satisfaction. <clears throat> so take a look at this cartoon here. This is actual a drawing of a nurse who is being yelled and screamed at by a in this case, it happened to be a physician executive, OBGYN. Just by looking at that, you can see the sheer emotionality to it and the tension that's involved, just by simply looking at that. So let me give you this particular vignette. vignette. So a, physician, excuse me, a nurse did not call the physician about a change in patient condition because that physician had a history of being abusive when called. And the patient suffered because of this. So let's imagine this, that you have this particular nurse, and this nurse has some clinical information that she wants to relay to the physician, but she's concerned. She's thinking, okay, do I call to benefit the patient, but if I call, am I going to get yelled at? Am I going to get screamed at? What's going to happen? So now this nurse is going back and forth in her mind as to what she should do. Meanwhile, the patient's status is continuing to decline. So some of you might be saying to yourself, you know what, that nurse ought to really advocate for that particular patient. That nurse ought to put on her big girl or big boy pants and just uh, bite the bullet and contact that physician. But is it psychologically safe for that nurse? Is it career safe for that nurse? And why should that nurse be put in that position? What role does this physician have that has a, what, history of being abusive? So we want to eliminate these types of of situations that arise. And you know they're far too common than what they should be. So now let's go to a definition of disruptive behavior. This is not the definition, but more of a conceptual definition. But remember, when I started off, one of our learning goals is it's important for you to identify your own definition in your own organizations. So disruptive behavior is any inappropriate behavior, confrontational conflict, ranging from verbal abuse, the words can have an impact, to physical or sexual harassment. Words could be things that are perceived as threatening, condescending, humiliating, <clears throat> or disruptive behavior causes strong psychological and emotional feelings, which can adversely affect patient care. Imagine this that you have to go to the dentist within the next, let's say, month or two, and you're going to get a routine cleaning. So there's going to be a dental hygienist and there's going to be a dentist. And, you know, dental hygienists, they have kind of strong, uh, sharp objects that they're working with. So you're sitting in the waiting room. You're kind of mildly anxious because you really don't enjoy necessarily uh, getting a cleaning, but you're not, you know, too anxious. So as you're sitting there and you're waiting, you overhear a conversation between the dentist and the dental hygienist. You hear the dentist say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of you working here. You're always complaining. You show up late. I don't know what's going on with you. You know what, I'm going to fire you at the end of the day. I just can't take it anymore. You're just incompetent. So the dentist says that to the dental, to the dental hygienist. Then the dental hygienist responds back. You know what, and you can go to hell. So you overhear this conversation and then they call your name, so you're next to be seen. So my question for you is, what do you do? Do you cancel the appointment, or do you actually go back and now sit in the dental chair with the dental hygienist using kind of sharp objects in your mouth along your gum line? If you're like most people, you're going to cancel that appointment. Why? Because disruptive behavior causes strong psychological and emotional feelings, that dental hygienist, the fight or flight response would have kicked in, which means that that dental hygienist will not be able to focus cognitively on you and your gum line with those sharp objects in your mouth. 
<clears throat> now, some of you might be saying, well, Marty, it's different in the medical industry. We know how to compartmentalize. We know how to be professional. We know how to handle adversity and stress. That's bogus. <clears throat> because um, we are humans first, then we are medical professionals second. So we'll always trace it back to what's the impact on the patient. So now let's look at kind of some other terms for disruptive behavior. Now one of the things that we tend to do in healthcare that's slightly irritating for me is that we use pretty language to describe things that are ugly. For example, every other industry describes disruptive behavior as bullying or mobbing. We pretty it up and say disruptive behavior. Every other industry will call things sexual harassment or rape. What we call it in healthcare is a boundary violation. I think we need to call it what it is. But the important thing is for you and your organization to come up with your definition. So let's take a look at some of these images here. <clears throat> And you tell me whether they're examples of disruptive behavior or not. So for the first image there, so you see the man kind of pointing his uh, finger in her face. She obviously looks somewhat kind of distraught and distressed. He doesn't necessarily have an empathic look. In the middle there on the top, you see that gentleman kind of um, groping that particular woman with certain kind of predatory eyes, if you will. And for her, that look clearly suggests to me an unwelcome sexual advance. And then the far corner there, the gentleman's getting ready to get hit in the head with a laptop, so that's clearly disruptive behavior. Not only is that clearly disruptive behavior, that's actually criminal behavior. It actually falls under an assault and battery. So in some cases, disruptive behavior is very obvious. In other cases, it's more subtle. So go down to the bottom corner there, and you see that one two physicians there, one is kind of pinned up against the wall with the other one looking somewhat sternly. So is it a stern lecture? Is it just being emphatic? Or is he being chewed out? Hard to tell. In the middle there on the bottom, real clear, that guy's kind of yelling at the other one and his head is tucked down. And the very last one going back to almost like the 50s, that's hard to tell. So the important thing is, is that disruptive behavior is easy to identify in some cases, but not all cases, which is why you need a definition in your organization such that people can recognize what it is and set limits on it as it relates to your organization. <clears throat> so let's look at some examples of workplace bullying. And if you notice, I use the term bullying, not disruptive. This is not an exhaustive list. Being shouted at or humiliated, that's verbal. Being the target of practical jokes, verbal. Being blamed without justification, verbal. Being excluded or socially isolated, that's contextual, a bit verbal. <clears throat> physical intimidation. So if we go back to that previous slide for physical intimidation, so the gentleman with the hands on the shoulders of the woman, not only is that physical, that's sexual. The guy that's getting ready to get in hit in half the laptop, that's physical. One might argue on the bottom there in the middle is, if he throws that document at that particular gentleman, or if he continues to lean forward, you could construe that as physical intimidation. And then you have excessive micromanaging. <clears throat> so excessive micromanaging, but in a way that's humiliating, condescending, and then purposely withholding information, because that can impact the patient. So if you will notice, the examples are quite active and poignant, or the examples are a bit more subtle. So now let's take a look at some categories of disruptive behavior. <clears throat> so for the categories of disruptive behavior, you have nonverbal, so things as simple as raising the eyebrows, kind of rolling of the eyes. You have verbal remarks, and I gave some example of verbal remarks, and you have actions as well. So hiding or hoarding limited patient care items, uh, refusing or continually being too busy to help out, and you have withholding information. Now the important thing to keep in mind is some of you may be saying, you know what, these categories don't really fit with our organization's definition of disruptive behavior. That's fine. So make sure you come up with categories that make sense in your organization. Here's some other categories. Purposefully sabotaging. <clears throat> so I'm not a nurse by training, but I've had the, the pleasure and the opportunity 
to work with a number of nurses over the years. And, and nurses tell me, and if any nurses happen to be on this webinar, nurses will say, nurses eat their blank. And for those of you that are nurses, you thought to yourself and you said out loud, nurses eat their young. Young, I said. But for those of you that are not nurses, not familiar with that phrase, you're saying, nurses eat their young. What is that? So what it means is, is it's not uncommon for a new nurse to go up on a you know, new unit or an outpatient setting, and then this nurse will get the toughest cases, the toughest load, and not get the help or assistance that he or she needs because what's happening is the older nurses, more experienced nurses, they're socializing this new nurse. To socialize someone is great. To bully somebody is not. And where's the line? And just to be fair, this is not restricted just to nurses, but it's just that phrase, nurses eat their young, really highlights um, how in a lot of cases uh, new nurses are purposefully sabotaged. And who ultimately is harmed from that? The new nurse and the patient. And you'll get group infighting. <clears throat> So the term for disruptive behavior in Germany is called mobbing. And because what they do in Germany is it, the bullying does not happen between you know, one person and another person in general. Typically a group of people against another group, or it's a group of people against one other person. So that's, you have to think about cliques and tribes and factions if you get that type of bullying as well. And scapegoating. So if you think about the link between disruptive behavior and quality management, we really know now that one of the cornerstones of quality management, if there's an adverse outcome, is not to ask the question, who screwed up, but to ask the question, is what was wrong in the system by design or in the implementation of procedures and protocols? So think about it. Once you identify who did it, then what do you do? Now, if we're honest, in a lot of cases, once we identify who did it, then we want the punishment. So the, the shaming or the public hanging, if you will. <clears throat> so you really have to watch out for scapegoating. Now, I'm not suggesting that there's not a role for individual responsibility and accountability. That there is. But scapegoating in and of itself without looking at you know, uh, a root cause analysis or conducting the five whys is not as productive. Then you get passive aggressive behavior. And that can be a form of disruptive behavior. Lastly, broken confidences and not uh, respecting privacy. So if you will notice, there are a number of different categories of disruptive behavior. So it's more than just physical intimidation and assault. Okay. So now let's look at the prevalence of workplace bullying. So this is amazing to me. It's also saying 35% of the U.S. workforce 35% or 53 million Americans reported being bullied at work. That's a lot of people. That's too many people. Okay. Now what about health care? So health care is part of the workforce. Now there was a study, number of studies conducted by Weber and Rosenstein. And what Weber found is that disruptive behavior involves less than 5% of physicians who are committing those acts. Rosenstein found that 98% of nurses have seen or witnessed disruptive behavior and 68% of those nurses said that other nurses were disruptive, that other nurses were disruptive. So I don't want you to walk away from this particular webinar saying, well, it's only physicians that commit disruptive behavior false. It's nurses, it's administrators, it's psychologists, it's a whole host of individuals that may commit this and be victims of it. However, there are a couple things you have to consider with regard to disruptive behavior in healthcare and bullying. Two things. In general, there's a power dynamic. So those individuals that are higher ranked or higher in the pecking order are more likely to bully those in the lower ranks. And Women are more likely to be targets. So you have a power bias and a gender bias. And those are things that have to be addressed. So now let's think about it. Here's the big so what. So we've talked about the prevalence of disruptive behavior. We've gone through a number of categories of disruptive behavior. So some might be saying, I knew all that. 
Well, that's fine. So let's look at what needs to happen next. <clears throat> what are the consequences of disruptive behavior? Remember, I'm making the case that it has a negative impact on safety, quality, satisfaction, and engagement, and even cost. So let's look at a study from Rosenstein that was published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2011. What they found was is stress increased, frustration increased, loss of concentration increased, reduced nurse-physician collaboration increased, reduced information transfer increased, reduced communication increased, all bad news as it relates to patient safety and quality. And if that's not enough for you, <clears throat> now let's look at some more consequences of disruptive behavior from the same study. 66% of the respondents said that the disruptive behavior led to an adverse event, patient safety. 71% said it led to errors. 53% said patient safety in and of itself. 72% said quality of care. And 25% said patient mortality. Not morbidity, but mortality. Mortality is they believe someone died as a result of the disruptive behavior. Died. And 75% said it had a negative impact on patient satisfaction. Now some of you may say I could care less about patient satisfaction, but as you know, at least in inpatient settings now, is that you will be reimbursed based upon your HCAP scores. So patient satisfaction is more than just be nice, but also is having a financial impact. So really look at these consequences of disruptive behavior <clears throat> and ask yourself the question, so what? And if you say, ah, you know, c'est la vie, c'est la vie, I would say no, because you're really not doing your job as it relates to patient safety and quality and engagement if you ignore this. Because you can think about the negative impact that disruptive behavior has on adverse events, errors, patient safety, quality of care, patient mortality, 25% die, patient satisfaction. So now you're saying, okay, I get it. So, so what do we do with all this? So in essence, what I've laid out for you is the business and the clinical case for addressing disruptive behavior. Now, as it relates to the business case, I really want you to frame it from a risk management point of view. What risks are you managing? So let's just kind of go back. You're managing all those risks right there identified on the consequences of disruptive behavior. Those are some risks, as well as financial risk, public relations risk, and legal risk. So when you frame disruptive behavior, don't frame it from an HR point of view. HR counts, but it's more than HR. Then also frame it from a clinical point of view. It's negative impact on safety and quality. This is not based upon some anecdotal data, but this is based upon empirical data within a number of specialties within medicine. So that's your wake-up call. So you've established the business and the clinical case as a risk management strategy. Okay, if you're still not moved towards action, then let me help you out. Think about accreditation. The Joint Commission standard, which came out in 2009, said each organization has come up with its own definition of disruptive behavior and then do something about it, prevent it and address it. On the legal front, there's a landmark workplace bullying case that just happened to involve a perfusionist and a cardiovascular surgeon in the state of Indiana. So if anybody's listening from the state of Indiana, this ruling applies to you. For those in the other 49 states, this ruling does not apply because it happened at the Indiana Supreme Court, but there's still a lesson and a wake-up call for you. So here's the case. The perfusionist claimed that the cardiovascular surgeon, while the surgery was going on, kind of physically moved towards him with popping eyes and clenched fists while the case was going on. So the, the end of the, of the legal story is, is that the cardiovascular surgeon lost the case. So it was the first workplace bullying case in the history of the United States of America. And that's important because prior to this case, 
you could not sue as a plaintiff based upon workplace bullying because workplace bullying was not recognized by the law as a legal theory upon which you could sue. After this case, then other judges, even outside of the state of Indiana, may say, you know what, you can sue for workplace bullying. Okay? So in those states where you cannot, the other 49 states, then what people look for is a legal hook. So let's say, for example, I perceive myself and have evidence to the fact that I was bullied. <clears throat> so I can't sue for workplace bullying. But I can under Title VII. I may say, you know what, the reason why they bullied me was because I'm Catholic, so I can get into the court. Or I can say, you know, they violated OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act, so I can get into the court. So people can find a legal hook. So accreditation, legal, and that's like an organizational. <clears throat> the labor shortages in healthcare are going to get worse, not better. Given that, you really have to make sure that your staff are engaged and your staff are not going to be engaged if they don't feel psychologically safe, physically safe, and career safe. And disruptive behavior erodes safety on all three of those dimensions. The other organizational consideration, when you look at a culture of safety, you have to think about a high reliability organization. And when you have disruptive behavior, it's not moving towards high reliability, but low reliability. And from a sociocultural perspective, a lot of people simply don't put up with it anymore. So this is the generic call to action. What you have to do in your organization is tailor this specifically to your organization. So let's do a deeper dive into the legal risk. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in 17 states, they have healthy workplace bills that are going through state legislatures. And what they would do at the state level is, is to make workplace bullying an unlawful employment practice, which means that a plaintiff could sue in state court but not in federal court. Other legal risks is, is that disruptive behavior can be construed as a violation of the general duty clause under the Occupational and Safety Health Act. You may also get into legal hot water for negligent hiring. So if you have hired someone knowingly that had a history of disruptive behavior in another organization, or you can be in legal hot water for negligent referral. You give someone a glowing recommendation to go to another employer, but you fail to mention that they were involved in a case of disruptive behavior in your organization that's been documented. And another area that's not listed here is negligent retention. So you have an individual that has a history of disruptive behavior, but nothing's been done. So then you have another employee that sues you, the organization, for negligent retention. So there are legal risks. Now let's do a little deeper dive into the general duty clause for OSHA. And I'll read this. <clears throat> each employer shall furnish to each of his employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards. That's more than asbestos. So a recognized hazard can also include a human being that displays workplace violence. And with regard to OSHA, disruptive behavior or bullying is an element of workplace violence. So you need to frame it as such. Even if there hasn't been any physical contact, it's still violent. Sorry about that. So now let's go to the next one, the Joint Commission. <clears throat> so this is actually the language from the Joint Commission. Leaders create and maintain a culture of safety and quality throughout the organization. So you can, you can see here that the Joint Commission is making a clinical case. And when they say culture, culture as defined by an organization basically is the way we do things around here. That's the culture. And most organizations has a formal culture, and that you can find that in the mission, the vision, policies, procedures, stories, which you talk about during orientation. So that's the formal culture. And you have the informal culture, which is the real deal. And sometimes the real deal culture is diametrically opposed or opposite to the formal culture. 
<clears throat> healthy cultures, the formal culture and the informal culture, mirror one another. Now, what's the rationale for this Joint Commission standard? Safety and quality thrive in an environment that supports teamwork and respect for other people regardless of their position in the organization. So when you think about position, that goes back to what we talked about earlier, it's about power. Yep. And as you know, better than I probably, healthcare is one of the most hierarchical organizations of all types of organizations. And in fact, I, used to, I worked at one particular hospital, and when I first got there, you know, I had my name badge with my title, and I would walk into the elevator, and what I would notice is <clears throat> people would look at my badge, and I'd gradually be able to see that they would look at my title, and then based upon that, they would say, hello, good morning, how are you, or nothing. Now, it's fascinating to me, because I haven't worked in you know, any other industry where people are going to make a decision as to whether they speak to you or not based upon your title. So it's very hierarchical. So here's the thing. <clears throat> you probably have, if you're like most healthcare organizations, some individuals that engage in disruptive behavior or that bully. And you may not want to say their name out loud because they might be sitting next to you. So, but just kind of think it out loud. So really, the organization, and if you're in a leadership or management role, has to say down office bully. But it can be frightening. Now, you don't want to kind of say down office bullying when the guy's looking at you like this. Because this is an image of someone who is emotionally hijacked. <clears throat> Cortical inhibition has set in for this gentleman. The amygdala is on fire, if you will. And he's in the fight or flight response. To confront this individual could be dangerous to your health to allow the individual to get a more relaxed and composed look before you intervene. Now, when you're intervening with individuals that are displaying disruptive behavior, embrace a certain level of incompetence. Because it could be dangerous, so you want to manage the risk, right? But fundamentally, you have to send the message down off its bullying, but be very careful about when you do it, recognizing that you can't Google an answer nor is there an algorithm. So let's look at some of the current approaches to both prevention and management of disruptive behavior in healthcare settings. Now this fact is amazing to me. It, it, it is not as amazing that 25% of respondents to that one survey reported that disruptive behavior is connected to mortality, but nearly two-thirds of the respondents to a survey of 7,000 740 adults, not a small sample size, reported that employers ignored the situation. They didn't deal with it. <clears throat> and I'm going to put on my HR hat here for a minute. If your employees are being ignored by the organization or by you about a legitimate claim based upon how they frame legitimate, then they're going to go outside the organization. They're going to go to an attorney, they're going to go to press, or they're going to get justice in their own respects or they're going to go to a union. They're going to find some outlet to protect them or at least hear them. So these are some common reasons why employers don't act. It's your fault because of what you did. So what happens is an employee says, I was a victim of disruptive behavior. And the response is, what did you do to upset them? What did you do to cause it? Blaming doesn't help. So now they have been violated twice. Or here's the politically protected employee. Dr. X generates a lot of revenue and is a friend of the board chair. So in other words, untouchable, leave him alone. That's an ethical issue there. Leadership matters. <clears throat> Your staff are more likely to take action when they believe others would take similar action, like you. Leaders will take action and protect. Protect from what? recognizable hazard, going back to ocean language, they're more likely to take action if they know something will happen. It will be investigated fairly. They're likely to take action if they know and feel safe that they will not be retaliated against, and if they can trust the process. It actually investigation process, a fair hearing process, works. So when you really think about it is you want to create a culture where not only leaders and managers say, you know what, that was inappropriate based on our culture here, but you have P 
peers telling other peers that's inappropriate. That's really the direction you want to go. But that won't happen unless these particular conditions are not put into place. So leadership matters. <clears throat> now some of you might be thinking, well, I'm not the CEO, the CMO, I'm not a member of the C-suite, I'm not a member of the board, so this slide has nothing to do with me. Oh, <clears throat> if you're directing imaging, if you're directing the lab, if you're directing an urgent care, if you're directing you know, group practice, if you're directing a site, whatever it is, you're the leader of that particular entity, so your leadership matters. Don't pass the book. So here's the five-step process that I said I would provide you with as a nice, quick, easy tool to help guide you to both prevent but fundamentally to address disruptive behavior. First, define expected behavior. Okay? So again, that goes back to what we talked about. Measure actual behavior. Then provide feedback and coaching to close any deviations from what's accepted in your organization. And the feedback and coaching doesn't always have to come from you, the leader or the manager. It can also come from peers. Fundamentally, you've got to manage that disruptive behavior, embracing a certain level of incompetence. And don't forget to care for and protect the victim. But in a lot of cases, we forget to care for and protect the victim. There's always more than one party when disruptive behavior occurs. Leadership is not about the moment of truth. It's about every moment. <clears throat> so imagine this. You're walking down the hall. You just step into a conference room. And then as soon as you walk into that conference room, you're on the very top there. You see the gentleman kind of leaning towards the lady. Her eyes are down. Flip chart is there. What do you say? What are you thinking? Is it a heated exchange? Well, it looks like he's heated, but she has her eyes down, maybe suggesting, maybe feeling a little bit fearful and intimidating. And you want to go in with an allegation, but you may want to say, hey, tell me what, what's going on. You want to interrupt it. Or if you flip to the other side on the top there, so you have you know, a lady with her arms kind of wide open and the other one kind of pulling back. Maybe she's just emphatic. Maybe she's just very emotional. Maybe there's nothing that is disruptive. But again, you want to jump in. And you can see the hand of someone there by that coffee cup close to the front of that picture. So maybe they're going to say something or not. On the bottom there, so you have the two in scrubs. So again, is that disruptive? Hard to say. So maybe you want to monitor to see whether anything else happens and then prevent something from occurring. On the lower side there, the man and the woman there, clearly she's given the, the visual uh, facial expression is unwelcome sexual advance. So intervene. So in a lot of cases, you don't necessarily need you know, witnesses and a whole lot of data to intervene. And I would say this to some of you are saying, Marty, before I intervene, I need a number of data points. Why would you wait for a trend? Because if you wait for a trend, you're increasing the probability that one of your fellow caregivers will be harmed and that one of the caregivers will be distracted, and then patient safety and quality will be compromised. Do not wait for a trend, but don't go in with an allegation. Find out what's going on. So now what? <clears throat> so imagine this. You're in a situation like the ones I just portrayed, and you have to confront disruptive behavior right then and there. Spot it on the spot and speak up. This is why your definition in your organization is important, because you'll really be able to know if it fit with our definition or not. In certain cases, you may decide to walk away because someone's really shouting and screaming. But if you do walk away, if someone attacks you, that's fine, because you don't want to tolerate an adult temper tantrum. But you want to make sure that you close the loop and you get back. Because there's a famous kind of thing in this whole field is what you permit and some of you may complete this, is what you promote. So I'll say that again. What you permit, you promote. And, I, and this is such a wonderful thing. I want you to really have it ring true in your mind, is what you permit, you promote. So the third bullet there is how to confront disruptive behavior. is confront the bully, but calmly, because you don't want to excite or cause conflict. 
If you're a witness, speak up. But your organization has to make sure, your leader or manager has to make sure that you'll be protected if you take the risk to speak up. It has to be physically safe, psychologically safe, and career safe to do so. So what can employees do if you happen to be the target of workplace bullying or victim yourself? First is recognize that in many cases, the motivation of the person that's engaging in a disruptive behavior, it's about power and control as well as maybe gender issues. So you need to recognize that. Also, realize it's not your fault. So don't go into this, well, what did I do to provoke this? You didn't do anything to provoke it. And if you're not getting a good response from leadership or management of your organization, then maybe you have to leave that division of the organization itself. Keep a detailed written diary and paper trail. <clears throat> because it may be the case that you don't get a good response from your organization, like 62% of folks in that one survey, is 7,740 adults, then you may have to seek legal recourse, regulatory recourse, PR recourse, or other recourse. So really make sure that you have a good paper trail for yourself. So I've talked quite a bit about addressing disruptive behavior when it occurs. So I think it's only fair to talk a little bit about prevention. So you want to create and enforce a zero tolerance policy. <clears throat> so again, going back to what the American Association of Critical Care Nurses advocated, and not only that, the American Association of Nurse Executives, the American College of Healthcare Executives, all of them have policies about disruptive behavior. And oddly enough, all of those policies really have a connection to ethics. And even the American Medical Association, their Committee on Judicial and Ethical Affairs, their policy on disruptive behavior has more of a patient focus. So you want to address bullying behavior as soon as possible. So let's imagine you have someone who, when they become frustrated, they tend to become more sarcastic and more biting sarcastic. And you're beginning to watch other people when they're the brunt of the sarcasm is that they're giving you nonverbal or verbal responses that it feels almost threatening, intimidating, embarrassing, humiliating. So you want to nip that in the bud. <clears throat> so you want to give that person feedback. And maybe something like this. Say I was that person. Say, Marty, you know, I just wanted to give you some feedback that it's my sense that sometimes when you get frustrated, you, you tend to be a bit sarcastic, and that's okay. But have you ever observed the reaction of some people in the meeting that we have when that happens? I'm not sure whether you have, but the next time, just take a look at their reaction. Don't say anything. And why don't we have a little dialogue about that? Because my concern is, is that some people are not uh, welcoming that. So just, just take a look at that. So that's a way of giving people an opportunity to take the perspective of other folks and hold an awareness campaign. So once you have your policy, you've communicated your policy, mm -hmm. then really let people know uh, what are the processes, policies, procedures, and mechanisms in the organization, in the site, in the department that both prevent and address disruptive behavior. And more importantly, if you've had some cases without revealing individual uh, data, and say, you know, we had 24 complaints in 2012, you know, 20 of those complaints were investigated according to this process, and they were found without merit. Four of those cases um, were found to have merit. Two of them resulted in discipline, one resulted in a resignation, and one resulted in termination. So you want to give people actual data about how well your particular process works. And as a leader or manager, you want to model effective professional behavior. <clears throat> so how do you handle your own frustration? How do you handle your own disappointment? Do you sometimes go a little bit close to the edge and may engage in behaviors or make comments that would be construed by others as intimidating, hostile, threatening? And if you find that you have group-on-group -group mobbing or bullying, then you really want to engage maybe HR or organizational development consultants in your organization who can come in and maybe facilitate meetings, even do a mediation between two or more parties, or design a group intervention. 
Because remember, this disruptive behavior can happen between two individuals, or it can be a group going after an individual, or two groups. So let's look at formulating a prevention plan. And if you'll note, the acronym is BEGIN NOW. So BEGIN NOW means like today. And most of you have begun, but just find out where your starting point is on this particular slide and move from there. So begin today and go beyond the Joint Commission. That's why I wanted to spend some time up front outlining the business case and the clinical case. So it's more than a regulatory requirement. That's important, but it's more than that. Enlist the support of key champions who make decisions, who are respected, who are credible, and are good models of their own behavior in your organization. Take the lead on this. And what I have found in my experience in healthcare for whether it's clinical initiatives, financial initiatives, operational issues, whatever the initiative is, is if you don't have a key champion or champion, things die on the vine. So get one or more than one. Gather data. So what are your statistics on recruitment, retention, risk management, safety, quality, um, occupational health, safety and health violations? Gather some data. And then ask yourself the question by really doing a deeper dive into the data is, to what degree are these things caused by or exacerbated by, caused by or exacerbated by disruptive behavior? And also when you're collecting data, then begin to take a look at uh, what are the consequences for those situations in which disruptive behavior has been documented to occur in your organization. Now let's move to the I. Identify causes and drivers. So what's really going on behind this? Now the research is pretty clear. During times of organizational change and transition and restructuring, then disruptive behavior increases. So I said during times of organizational change, transition, and restructuring. Boy, does that really cover everything that we're experiencing in healthcare today. And you want to navigate changes to the political and the cultural terrain. So if you currently have politically protected employees, why do you? And then do you intend to keep it that way or change it? So you really fundamentally have to look at your culture. And then for the now, you want to normalize a new way of interacting. Because some of you have grown up in certain healthcare organizations where it's like, you know what, this is just the way we roll in healthcare. We shout at people, we cuss at people, we throw things at people. We kind of, you know, splash, you know, blood and fluids on people. Uh, you know, we occasionally have a little sexual fun. This is the way we roll in healthcare. No. So you have to normalize a new way of interacting. That time is gone. Observe changes toward improvement. And not only observe changes toward improvement, but celebrate. You really want to celebrate because that gives people a sense of recognition and more motivation and energy to move forward and do greater work. <clears throat> and welcome successes and, I should capitalize this, address pockets of resistance. There will be pockets of resistance, but you really want to make sure you address those. Uh, Woody Hayes, the famous football coach from Ohio State, said persistence paralyzes resistance. So Woody Hayes says persistence paralyzes resistance. We have two nice little kind of quotes for the day. Uh, what you permit, you promote, and persistence paralyzes resistance. So be persistent. So this is just an example of a zero tolerance uh, policy for abuse. This is not the example, but just an example for you. And if you will note, where it says policy there, it's the policy of blank to promote a work environment, and this is where they use their definition, their definition. Pleasant, helpful, comfortable, free from intimidation, hostility, free of abuse, verbal or physical. So there's the descriptors that could interfere. So it's not necessarily did interfere, but could interfere with work performance and the delivery of safe, quality patient care with an X. They go one step further, and they say, like hospital, zero tolerance, zero 
or behavior that is verbally or physically abusive and which could, not did, could, again, interfere with work performance and the delivery. And then they, in the third paragraph here, they go on to talk about who's potentially covered. The employee, contracted individuals or providers, voluntary medical staff, who report in good faith, on and on and on. So you can see that the policy does not have to be 27 pages. It can be simple and to the point. So fundamentally, when we think about disruptive behavior, it's really all about values-based leadership. Who do we value in our institutions? Do we truly value our caregivers? Do we truly value our patients? Do we value their family members? And I hope the answer to that is yes. But then the $64,000 question is, is, how do you show that value on a shift-by-shift, day-to-day basis with everybody? So let me talk a little bit about the bystander effect. So ultimately what you want to do is you want to create an environment in your you know, site, division, department, center, wherever you are, where a critical mass of caregivers, not just you the leader, will step in and say that's not appropriate. So some of you may be familiar with Kitty Genovese. So Kitty Genovese, she was standing on a Brooklyn street, and then she was stabbed numerous times, and she was eventually killed through these stabbing. But while she was being stabbed, they estimated there were 38 bystanders, like on the street, peering through the windows, looking out through the blinds, looking out through crack doors. 38 bystanders watched this woman get knifed to death on a Brooklyn street. Horrendous. <clears throat> You're thinking, how come one of those 38 people didn't jump in and do something? because they knew and they could see other people were watching. And what they were all thinking is, I don't need to jump in, because I know that lady across the street, she's going to jump in. I know that man down the street, he's going to come to her rescue. Nobody came to her rescue. She died. Now, do we have the bystander effect in healthcare? Imagine this. You're in a meeting, <clears throat> or you're at the nurse's station. Someone and everybody agrees that they are now the target of disruptive behavior. They're getting chewed out, chewed out publicly. Everybody around the conference table is just kind of watching. They kind of pull back, get, get their Blackberry out, get their iPhone out, look in their iPad, look away, pretend like they're writing something. Or if it's in the nurse's unit, they look away, do some documentation, uh, start talking to each other. But nobody jumps in. Somebody has to jump in if you're serious about what? Values-based leadership. Values are only words unless enacted in your behavior. So please make sure that people feel safe to jump in. So the social psychological phenomenon in which individuals do not offer help in an emergency situation where others are present. You want to make sure that that does not happen in your organizations. So again, when you go back to value-based leadership, part of it is really developing an ethical culture. Because really, if, if you really think about ethics, it's really about not harming others, not hurting others. It's really what it is. So do you have a formal and informal control system to promote ethical behavior? Go back to that sample policy I just shared with you. And what happens if disruptive behavior violates your formal and informal control system? What are the consequences? And how is disruptive behavior identified, addressed, and what are the actions that are taken to eliminate it? So these are things that have to be put in place. And for those of you who are in settings where you may have a clinical ethics committee, part of the charge for the clinical ethics committee should also be to address disruptive behavior. You may be saying, for what? What does that have to do with clinical aspects? Go back to those earlier slides and the consequences. So the connection to the patient safety and quality is clearly there, clearly there. <clears throat> so is there anything unique to the medical staff? <clears throat> and in fact, there is. It's, it's how you really position disruptive behavior. So as you know, the, the American Board of Medical Specialties has six core competencies for quality patient care. And if you think about disruptive behavior, that has an impact on patient care, 
He had an impact on interpersonal communication skills as well as professionalism. And in fact, let's take a look at the bottom there at the AMA's definition, American Medical Association. AMA has defined disruptive behavior as a style of interaction, go back to number three, interpersonal communication skills, with physicians, hospital personnel, patients, family members, or others that interferes with patient care, go back to number one. And you could argue, although professionalism is not written in that definition, you could argue also that professionalism as well. So for those of you that may be physicians or work with physicians, you can really approach this topic from another angle. You can approach it from the organizational angle, patient care angle, or professionalism angle. Use as many angles as necessary to get to the point. So kind of in conclusion, before we open it up to any questions or comments that you may have, and I'd be more than happy to address anything, is I want to leave you with this particular thought. Work is love made visible. So healthcare as an industry is stressful. And it's going to be stressful. This is the nature of it. However, let's reduce the unnecessary stress. And let's really take the lead of Lucian Lee, who is a professor at Harvard School of Public Health, that is really is focusing a lot of his work now on caregivers helping other caregivers. When you think about disruptive behavior, it's us helping one another as caregivers and also our patients. That really is where the focal point ought to be. So with that, the concluding remark is, we can't change the human condition, but we can change the condition under which humans work. Let's do that. So with that, I'll open it up. Thank you, uh, Dr. Martin. That was a great presentation. We did have one question come in that I'd, I'd like to read for you and then have you comment. Uh, the question is, please explain what you mean by embracing a certain level of incompetence. Yep, great question. So what I mean by that is, is that your, your policy and procedure that you have for disruptive behavior may bump up against other policies and procedures, maybe medical bylaws, maybe attendance policies, where you really have to interpret it in a very refined way, so that could feel awkward. So that's one level of incompetence. The other level of incompetence is you may be relatively new to this form of confrontation, so you're on a learning curve. So you really haven't mastered it as a skill or an art. So it's going to feel awkward. But with more practice, as well as maybe reviewing with someone within your organization before you intervene and after you intervene, then you can become more competent in that regard. So it really addresses, do you have good supporting policies and procedures, and just your own level of comfort and experience dealing with conflict and confrontation. Great, thank you. And I did want to address a couple, several people who had asked the same question that I can address, and that is, we'll, we'll be uh, able to get a copy of the presentation. The answer to that is certainly yes. yes. We'll send out a, a link to that recording this afternoon. So um, that will answer several questions. And we just had another one pop in, so I'm going to read that to you. Uh, in your experience, what percentage of physicians who engage in disruptive behavior backslash bullying can be rehabilitated compared to the percentage that generally have to be asked to leave the organization? And how long does that rehabilitation process take? Yeah, that's another, another great question. So I, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind as you read that question, Trish, it's trying to cite a study in my mind. So I, one's not coming to mind, so don't quote me kind of chapter and verse on this particular statistic I'm about to throw out. But, but I would say that about one in three uh, can be, if you will, rehabilitated. And what I mean by I use the term rehabilitation that came from the question is the focus is not on changing that physician's personality. The focus is not on changing their practice pattern. What the focus is, is, is very highlighted, is to make sure they do not engage in those behaviors again. Because they may be a great clinician, have great clinical outcomes, have great patient satisfaction scores, but it's this one area and domain that's limited. So you really want to do a hyper focus on that. However, let me add to this. There have been some studies that have looked at physicians that have gone to either intensive day treatment programs or to inpatient programs for disruptive behavior. And the, the number one, if you will, kind of diagnostic as the reason why they wind up in those programs is what they call family of origin issues, or the V-code. Yep. 
So some of them may have substance abuse, some of them may have personality disorders, but the number one driver is family of origin problems. And what that means is this. Imagine is they grew up in a household where mom and dad were very confrontational. They yelled and screamed. They threw things. Things were smashed. That was normal to them growing up. They may have also lived in a neighborhood that was kind of tough, but people did that as well. But yet they were very smart and very likable and very charming. So they got through elementary school, junior high school, high school, college, medical school. And people would address it, but not really, because they were nice and they were charming and they were smart. So now they wind up with you, and they've never really learned a more appropriate way to relate to others. So that's good news because you can modify some of those behaviors. But in about two out of three cases, what happens is the individual will have to leave the organization in about two out of three of those cases. Um, another question, what kind of discipline do you suggest for this type of behavior other than termination? Yeah, I'm, that's great. Uh, I think termination ought to be the last step unless it's something that's egregious. Like if someone pulls out a gun and pistol whips somebody, then termination ought to be the first step. But if it's uh, condescending, humiliating, threatening, then most organizations have what's called a progressive discipline process or maybe a fair hearing process. They typically are four steps. So the first step, what we like to call it in the industry, is sit down with a cup of coffee. So that way it's informal, off the record, and you're just going to provide feedback and position about what you've observed, about what you heard. And then you're going to make a request, do something that's called feed forward, and maybe give them suggestions about how to modify their behavior. So that's informal, step one. Step two, if that doesn't work, then you'd say, okay, now we're entering our formal discipline process, and this is going to be a verbal communication between the two of us, but I'm going to record in writing this verbal communication has occurred. I'm also going to give you the policy as well to let you know what happens if this step doesn't work. Then we're going to move to the third step. So the third step would be a written warning, and then the fourth step typically is some type of uh, you know, reduction of privileges or termination for that particular step. So I think you need to be fair to give people ample time and resources to modify their behavior, recognizing that it cannot occur overnight. Um, unless it is something that is extremely egregious, then you fire them on the spot. Could you speak to another area of disruptive behavior, which is the powder that is never happy with anything and always manages to see the negative in everything we do? Yep, and that kind of goes to one of the categories, if you remember, was about the micromanager. So if this particular individual happens to be, they could be a preceptor, they could be a mentor, they could actually be your boss. Um, where that bullying comes into play, it tends to be more verbal, and then it also, in a lot of cases, is a threat that you might be terminated or fired or get a crummy shift or have to do certain tasks that you don't want or have support withdrawn. So that is definitely disruptive because how it's defined as disruptive, if you perceive it as threatening or humiliating, and that's on an emotional level. And cognitively, if it's impacting your problem solving, decision making, prioritization, concentration, or on the interpersonal level, interfering with you getting and giving information with other team members or interact with other team members, that's why it's disruptive because it's disruptive to the work performance. That's whether you're in a clinical situation or not. So that's a bit more subtle, and you have to look for a pattern, but you can clearly make the case that it is disruptive. Great, thank you. And that was the last question that we had come in for today. So Dr. Martin, again, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And to everybody on the line, we appreciate your time. And again, we thank the Urgent Care Association of America for their partnership in providing this webinar. And you'll be receiving an email from me this afternoon with the link to the presentation and a copy of the slides so that you can listen at your convenience. And with that, we hope you have a wonderful day. And we'll see you next month. Great. Thank you, Trish.